become um, disciples and well-wishers of His Holiness Chandramouli Maharaj. It's lovely to have everybody back. It's nearly been a year since we last met for our disciples retreat. And unfortunately we can't be together, but I think this is the next best thing. So welcome, it's so lovely to have everybody join. Thank you Guru Maharaj for giving us the opportunity to have your association and spearheading this for us. So it just leaves me to say on behalf of the retreat team, Please accept our humble obeisances, all glories to Sri Prabhupada, all glories to our Guru Maharaj, and all glories to the assembled Vaishnavas that have assembled on this call. So before we start, we just have a few ground rules that we'd like everybody to adhere to. First ground rule is that you're welcome to have your cameras on, but please be mindful of your movement and also we ask that everybody stays on mute unless you've been asked by the host or the speaker to unmute yourself because this will help with the um, transmission of the program. And also, if you have any questions for this session at the end, please direct them to Radha Bhakti uh, Mataji and she will then, we will then ask on your behalf. Um, be mindful that if we run out of time, then we've always got tomorrow, part two, and we've always got the Easter Goshti. So we'll try and answer all your questions that you have throughout this retreat. The next thing I would just like to say is we have um, Ekta Mataji, who is collecting donations, and we've actually sent that to you in the schedule, that if you'd like to make a donation, please forward that to Ekta Mataji. Another thing is and that um, we have got a very packed weekend, so we'll try, try and stick to timings. And we will start this afternoon with Guru Maharaj, and he will start the session, kick off this whole weekend for us in the right way. And um, we're going to start this session with the Gita Nagari scheme. And this afternoon is going to be the first part and followed by tomorrow morning, which will be the second part. So we welcome Guru Maharaj, and we only ask that followed by this, can, if you still stay muted, we have Kirtan by the Slovenian team. So they will then take over and please stay on mute and we will just listen and chant um, in our own time. Because if we all unmute, then we won't be able to hear the Kirtan effectively. So at this moment, I would say, like to say, welcome Guru Maharaj. And the floor is all yours. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you very much, Sopa Mataji. Thank you to all the devotees. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha. Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapita Mayana Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadanti Swa Padantikam Bandeham Shigaro Shiuta Padikamalam Shigarum Vaishnavam Scha Shi Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganath Raganatam Vikam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Spitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvishay Sasunyavari Pastyakya Dev Satarine Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandhu, Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Namostate, Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi, Radhe Vrindavane Swari, Rikavanu Suti Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Vansha Kalpa, Tarubis Chakripa Sindhu Pei, Pachapatitana, Bhavane Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namaho Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya. Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara Simasari Gaur Bhakta Vindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. 
So as was mentioned by Mother Shilpa, uh, we're going to get an insight of Srila Prabhupada's vision for spreading Krishna consciousness worldwide. And this vision was something that he developed back in the 1940s, or maybe even before that. Uh, it's not like when Srila Prabhupada came, he had no idea on how to proceed. He had a very clear understanding of what he wanted to do. He wasn't sure how it would unfold, coming to a place where there were persons who were trained or untrained, you might say, and uh, living according to standards that were way below the Vedic uh, concept. Persons who um, didn't have any, what we say, pious activities, or if they did very little. But Prabhupada's vision was there. And he put that vision into a very lengthy document, which he penned in the year 1948, which was called The Conception of Gita Nagari. Now the word Gita Nagari, uh, the term itself is a little ambiguous, but in this context, the word Nagari can mean place, town, dwelling, and Gita, in this sense, refers to divine place or divine song, divine dwelling. That place where religious principles and service to God are the only focus and where people live their life according to the principles as given by Krishna, especially is mentioned in this particular concept in the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada said that he wanted to come and make a revolution and turn the entire world society towards spirituality. It's not that Srila Prabhupada came simply to present some new or unique or different religious practice. He wanted to transform the entire world into a principle of spirituality from every walk of life, from every aspect of society, political, social, familial, administrative, uh, whatever you can think of makes up the activities and the, the departments that make up the human society. Prabhupada wanted a transformation of that towards eternal religious principles. This is very important to understand because what Prabhupada came to do was a revolution, not simply a uh, spiritual movement that was just something that he got from his spiritual master and he was going, it was actually Lord Chaitanya's plan to revolutionize the whole society towards God consciousness. Not society, but the whole world actually. So he wrote that conception in a, in a paper called Gita Nagari and he presented it to some religious people, other some politicians, also the president of India at the time. And Prabhupada based it on Gandhi's conception. Um, Gandhi had a the same idea, but in a, in a more limited context. Gandhi wanted to transform the whole society also towards spiritual and religious principles along with ideal material lifestyle that would support these religious principles, such as village um, development, where each and every village in India has its own rule, its own uh, 
set of laws. In other words, each village would be governing themselves, build the whole concept of village life. That will come up also in this presentation, but that'll be in the second half of the presentation. Um, what Prabhupada wanted was explained when he was in, uh, in New York in 1966, 65, 66. And it's interesting, um, our good, dear uh, friend, God brother in one sense, Uta Bhavana Prabhu, has chosen those seven principles that Prabhupada made as his presentation. What I'm presenting is a more of a condensed version of those same seven principles coming from Srila Prabhupada's original text known as Gita Nagari. And Prabhupada systematically presented these four main items of his movement in such a way that he unfolded his movement step by step. And of course, he adjusted things according to how things were going at the time. And the first step that he made for the first presentation is that um, Prabhupada, in this Gita Nagari concept, said that um, the society is governed by demoniac principles. And Prabhupada went through the entire, practically the entire 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, citing the characteristics, mindset, qualities of the demons as a way to show that this is what we are moving towards, this is what we are living in, and this is what we want to uproot and reestablish the kingdom of God based on these principles. So the first thing that Prabhupada did was he knew that Gandhi was very much, although Gandhi was a politician in one sense, he, see, he used to say that he was a he was a politician amongst the saintly persons and a saintly person among the politicians. But he spent a lot of his time trying to move out uh, foreign rule and reestablish spiritual values based on particularly the Bhagavad Gita. And these four principles are also mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita by Krishna. And so Gandhi moved, formulated his life and his political work around these four principles. And the first thing was that we can mention, which unfolds as Srila Prabhupada's movement unfolds, is holy books and holy names. Aside from the busy life of Gandhi, he always had time and he would make time regularly every day to read and recite the Bhagavad Gita and offer his individual prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead Lord Sri Krishna, who was the teacher of the Bhagavad Gita. So Prabhupada emphasized that that he used to have his daily prayer meetings, regular recitations of the, Bhagavad, of the Bhagavad Gita. And this idea was to uh, rid the world of demoniac life. So he wanted to present that as one of his main teachings that everyone should read, study, learn, and hear recitations on the Bhagavad Gita. Now Prabhupada in his practical application of that particular uh, principle started the whole idea of the Harinam Sankirtan movement. Of course, this is Lord Chaitanya's movement, but Prabhupada started our movement based around Harinam Sankirtan. And you can see when you go back to the history and you see how this movement unfolded, one of the first things that Prabhupada did 
was to have Kirtan in Thompson Square Park in 1965 with a few of his fledging uh, disciples, you might say, followers. There were no disciples at that day, but they were following Prabhupada. And he wanted to take this Harinam or chanting the glories of the Lord all around the world into the streets. And as the movement unfold, unfolded, this was Prabhupada's push. And so we became a um, interesting phenomena, you might say, in the eyes of people in general, especially in the American society, where people who were Westerners were now wearing religious clothes of people who were from India, shaved up with, with ponytail uh, markings of the Vaishnav, Kunti Mala, all the dress of the Vaishnav, singing and dancing publicly in streets. Now Prabhupada really, really pushed that at the beginning. He had all of his little centers as they grew from one center to another. Um, first it was New York, then San Francisco, then Los Angeles, then Montreal, then um, New Mexico. Gradually, gradually as the centers, and every one of the centers would go out on Sankirtan, practically every person that was a member of the society at that time. And so you found them in arenas, plazas, parks, beaches, the devotees were everywhere. Uh, this is very much evident if you are able to find or get a hold of the old Back to Godhead magazines in the early days when they were first published, publicized. Every magazine was full of uh, pictures of devotees doing Harinam in different cities around the world. So that was the movement. And Prabhupada really, really emphasized that. He, and he also took part of it in, in San Francisco in 1967, where he danced and chanted in the streets along with the devotees. And he created the first Rathayantra festival that was done with a pickup truck that had no back on it and the deities facing in three different directions. And uh, Prabhupada kept that principle of Harinam Sankirtan as the way to spread his movement. That was interesting because here was the holy, holy names. So he took the holy name of Krishna, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, and from every town and village, we were known as the Hare Krishnas, simply because we were out in the streets in our religious garb, singing and dancing. I remember personally when I was in uh, New York, I, my first connection with Krishna consciousness was in Denver, Colorado, but I didn't stay there very long. I went to New York right after that. And in New York, every day, throughout the day, from morning to night, we would do, the devotees would do Harinam in different places in New York City. And then on uh, the weekends, it was called Maha Harinam, where the entire temple would empty out, except for the one Pujarian to maintain the deities. And we would do the Maha Harinam every Saturday night in, uh, in uh, Times Square, we'd find some place and we'd chant. And this is how our movement actually became visible. And this is how people actually started to see. Now you can under, now you know that in those days, well, of course, not the days when I was there, but even before that, we didn't have really any books. Prabhupada was, had translated uh, Nectar of Devotion and he had translated, um, uh, he was using at first uh, Radha Krishna's Bhagavad Gita. He didn't have a copy of his own. Only later, I think it was in 1968, that Prabhupada's Gita actually 
was first printed. And then there were Sri Upanishads, a little small paperback, but nobody considered using books as a way to propagate our philosophy to the people in general. We had a few books for our own reading. So everything was centered around mostly Sri Harinam Sankirtan. And Srila Prabhupada patterned that, that this is what Gandhi wanted to uh, emphasize that although I'm a politician in one sense, I'm a saintly person in real life, and I take time to worship, to read, to recite, and to understand Krishna's teaching in the Bhagavad Gita as the foundation for everything I do, both in my saintly life and in the political arena. So this was Prabhupada's uh, vision based on his conception of the uh, Gita Nagari. Gita Nagari is a place, but it's also a concept that Srila Prabhupada wanted to create for the entire world. Yeah, we have what I want to emphasize a little bit along with what we're explaining is Prabhupada's huge vision, huge plan for, and Prabhupada never thought small. He wanted to revolutionize the whole world. And that is still our mission, is to make the entire world Krishna conscious, or we might say God conscious. Okay. So holy names. And then of course, it was an accident, but it happened in such a wonderful way that it actually started another part of Srila Prabhupada's movement. And that is in 1970, when Srila Prabhupada had finished his uh, Krishna book. At that time, there was, uh, he had two volumes of Krishna book. Later, they had reprinted it into three volumes. But the original two volumes, Prabhupada did the whole summary study of the 10th canto in a more of a story-like form. Um, the reason Prabhupada did that is because he wasn't sure, due to his health and his old age, how long he would be there. He wanted to give Krishna and Vrindavan to the devotees before he left the world. So he did this uh, summary study of the entire 10th canto in the form of this Krishna book. But it was one day, uh, there were two devotees. One was Premardana, wonderful devotee, Premardana and um, uh, what was his name? I can't remember. It was another devotee. And they were traveling in one car. And they pulled into a gas station. And they, uh, the gas man came out and put gas in their car. And then came to collect the money. But the devotees realized we have no money. <laughs> so they were embarrassed. But Premardna, I think it was him, uh, I think Maha, not Mahabhu, but I can't remember the other name, devotee's name. Uh, Ray Martin came up with the idea, oh, we have these books. So let's offer the book in place of the money for the gas to the gas attendant. So he said, I'm sorry, we didn't know it. We don't have any money, but would you take these, these books, Krishna book, as an exchange, and the person said, yeah, without any, any uh, you know, problem. He, he said, yeah, he, he liked the cover. He was attracted by the book. And so that began book distribution in America. Before, all we had was these Back to Godhead magazines. <coughs> the devotees would sometimes um, go out in the streets and give a piece of incense or a stick of incense and uh, a Back to Godhead ma magazine and collect 10 cents or 25 cents. If you got 50 cents, that was considered to be a big donation at that time. 
So they were, we were just giving away practically uh, back to Godhead magazines. But when this book thing happened with the gas station, it sparked an idea that, hey, maybe we can do these books in public. And at that time, we had the Nectar of Devotion, we had the Krishna book and a few others. And so that began the second part or the second half of the first part of Prabhupada's mission to, us, to set up and distribute, to write, to print books and to distribute books worldwide. And then the book distribution movement took off. And then from 1972, 73, all the way up to the time of Prabhupada's disappearance, the emphasis was really strong on that distribution of books means the Sankirtan. And Prabhupada renamed or expanded the whole idea of Sankirtan to mean distribution of books. Before it was just Harinam. And when we say Harinam Sankirtan, we usually mean devotees chanting and dancing in the streets. But now the whole concept of Sankirtan included distribution of books. So a lot of times devotees say, well, I'm going out on Sankirtan. That means I'm going out to distribute books. And Prabhupada really, really pushed it because Prabhupada understood that the communist movement was somewhat successful and bringing people in to their philosophy because they printed so much literature and found different ways to distribute their literature. So Prabhupada's idea was, let's flood the world with books. <laughs> of course, Prabhupada got that inspiration to print books from his spiritual master Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in 1936 when he met his spiritual master in Radha Kund. At that time, Bhakti Siddhanta was quite in a very uh, uh, contrite mood. He was very much pensive, thinking of the situation that was going on in his present society. And he was concerned that the devotees were taking advantage of the increased facility sent by Krishna to take it easy and find different ways to decrease the Sankirtan spirit or the spirit of preaching that was going on at the time. And so he told Srila Prabhupada, if you ever get money, print books. But Prabhupada considered that a very big part of his mission to print books. But then now the idea on how to distribute the books, because when Prabhupada first started his movement, and he came to the New York City in 1965 and 66, or that time. Prabhupada had his uh, Srimad Bhagavatams that he had uh, written in India and brought over in America. And in, that, in those books, there was three volumes of the first canto. And the English was quite <laughs> different. Later, we reprinted it and corrected some of the, the English presentation, but you can see the original books have been printed in their original uh, uh, presentation style, just to show what Prabhupada had did in the early days. But Prabhupada was going in New York from bookstore to bookstore. He was thinking, well, the best way to sell books is go to stores that sell books. And so Prabhupada was the first person to do Sankirtan in that sense, going from store to store, asking the proprietors, the owners, to accept his books. And not even asking for any money, just to, just to accept them. And then if they sell, then he would take it on consignment like that. So Prabhupada was really determined to fulfill his spiritual master's order to print books and try to get books into the public hands. But when this incident happened at the gas station, somehow or other, a light went on and the idea is, 
we can sell books to people on the streets. And how many movements are doing that? Hardly any. And to this day, we have distributed about 600 million copies of Srila Prabhupada's books. And this is a conservative number because what was recorded is that much, but what is unrecorded is unrecorded, obviously. And a lot of books that were never recorded also went out. So we have became, we became what we say, sometimes famous or sometimes infamous, depending on uh, the historical uh, stories you hear, the stories about our movement, that we are out there on the streets distributing our books. And devotees became expert at approaching people and convincing people that this is something they had. And this is how the movement really, really unfolded. So, and then people were joining like crazy. Between Harinam and between holy books, the movement was expanding. Temples were opening all over America, also in Europe, uh, London, uh, Amsterdam, Germany, France, uh, every, many places in the world, temples were opening, both may, mainly because of Harinam and book distribution. So Prabhupada really saw that this principle, not only of practice, not only of distributing, but practicing to read and to chant as our own form of sadhana, our worship, and then going out and teaching that same thing to others became the foundation and also the uh, characteristic that we were known by. Even to this day, people call us the Hare Krishnas. Why? Because we were out on the streets chanting Hare Krishna. Somehow, you might say, unfortunately, our movement somehow or other has declined in that area of Harinam, although book distribution has not declined, that's, that's continued to go on because it was very, very important and dear to Prabhupada. Um, but Harinam has declined in many areas and sometimes we meet people who approach us and say, oh, you're a Hare Krishna, we don't see you anymore. We used to see you out in the streets. What happened? I remember when I was in Chicago, I would meet people and they would also, they would come up to me and say, where are you guys? We really like to see you out there. You, you add color to the streets. <laughs> and so, yeah, that was Prabhupada's way of, uh, and it was different. It was really different because it was unique and it was not the not the activity itself, but the way Prabhupada presented it to the to the general mass of people was interesting, and it had such a powerful effect in changing the lives of so many many devotees became devotees. Persons became devotees from Harinam and book distribution. These two things were Prabhupada's emphasis. Another point of Srila Prabhupada's movement was um, that in the Gita Nagari scheme, Prabhupada mentions how temples, and this was also Gandhi's concern, Gandhi wanted to revive the whole temple movement in India. And he was concerned because the temples formerly were places where people could con congregate and hear discourses on spiritual topics, could worship the Lord in his deity form, could associate with other persons who are doing the same and develop community and relationships. But then somehow or other, as time went on, temples changed and more and more it became infiltrated with the wrong type of people and things got turned around. And then many of the temples itself, rather than uh, being a vanguard or a way to 
inspire people in spiritual life became interested in collecting money in order to maintain the building in order for them to uh, have enough money so they could also maintain their families. And so the whole temple movement in India, Prabhupada says even now today, the temples, most of the temples that were there are just places where dogs and other animals congregate. Hardly anyone goes to temples anymore, at least in most places, aside from the big, big temples in the holy places. But uh, Prabhupada wanted to create or regenerate the spiritual movement through educational centers. And you can read in Srila Prabhupada's writings that he never considered a temple a place of worship only. That was a part of the temple. These were places where you could get spiritual education. Even today, people come to our temples to take darshan of the deities, and to receive a little maha prasadam of the Lord, and to maybe to meet some of their friends. And sometimes because the temples are a little lax in following Srila Prabhupada's vision for temples, people don't get what they could, they should get when they come to temples, and that is discourses on spiritual topics. And so Prabhupada's second phase, this is the second phase of his movement, was to establish temples worldwide. And this was written in the Back to Godhead magazine in 1956, Prabhupada, that the mission of Gita Nagari was to rectify the anomalies that have centered around temples and regenerate these temples for worship and places of spiritual education. And Prabhupada, in his expansion of temples, he was very interested in getting good-sized buildings in order to install deities. And Prabhupada was going from place to place, just like um, the Chicago Temple is an old Masonic Lodge. It was a place where the Masons would congregate for their meetings, and we somehow or other bought that and made a temple out of it. Prabhupada bought churches, Christian churches that were somewhat not so well, uh, active, or for whatever reason, they were selling churches, just like we saw, we see in. Uh, in, um, in Toronto, we have a beautiful king-sized temple that was formerly a church. It's, you can see the building from, from a long distance away. We, have a, we put a hot sign on the top of it. The church looks like a church building, but inside it is it's a Hare Krishna temple. And we have a big sign saying, Hare Krishna, you can see it from a long distance. The Prabhupada storefronts, the devotees were buying small places, the stores were selling out their buildings. They were either renting storefronts or buying storefronts, buying churches, buying old castles. And uh, we have the castles in Europe, um, in um, France, and in uh, Italy, and in uh, Spain, these were old castles that were, made, were, were bought by the money that we made from book distribution. We bought these temples. Uh, we bought these buildings and later transformed into temples. And in order to Developed the temple, Prabhupada wanted to install Radha Krishna deities. This was interesting. Prabhupada was not simply satisfied by just giving us worship on a simple level. He wanted to bring the worship all the way up to the highest form. So in Vrindavan temple, he established Radha Krishna, Krishna Balaram, Gornatai, Jagannath, in different places, Sitaram, Lakshman, Hanuman. 
the Shringadev, all the prominent manifestations of the Godhead were installed as deities in these temples. And devotees started to manufacture and make deities. We were making deities, we were importing deities, we were crafting deities, we were bringing in deities from different uh, ways and installing them into the temples and Prabhupada was going around from temple to temple doing the installation ceremonies for these temples. And so that was Prabhupada's second part of his mission was to um, establish these temples worldwide. And you can see some of the temples that we have nowadays are really grand where worship is going on in such a high level of activity that you can't find that anywhere except in very, very special ancient holy places such as Tirupati and Rameshwaram and some of the more established temples in India that have been there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So looking at our society, you'll see what Srila Prabhupada's vision was. We, we were opening temples, Radha Krishna temples, Gornitai storefronts, Stalling Jagannath. Prabhupada was really, really inspired. When Malati in 1968 found the little forms of Jagannath Baladev Subhadra in one curio shop in San Francisco and showed Prabhupada, she was fascinated. She had seen these little, uh, what we say, icons in the store that was in a large barrel filled with a lot of other things. And she somehow picked up Jagannath and showed it to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, as soon as he saw it, the, the Jagannath Didi was about maybe two inches high, not even, maybe less. Prabhupada got down from his seat and offered his obeisance. Nobody knew what Prabhupada was doing. But Prabhupada was showing his reverence to Lord Jagannath who had come. And he asked Malati, are there two more like that? Oh yes, so many. No, no, different ones. And she went back and she got Jaga, uh, Baladeva and Subhadra. And then Prabhupada had Sham Sundar carve uh, large sized deities, which are still today in the in the Berkeley Temple in Berkeley, California. The original Jagannath deities carved by uh, Sham Sundar in 1968. So. Uh, Prabhupada was very enthusiastic to install deities and open temples all around the world. And he knew, he knew we weren't qualified to worship the deities. We didn't have the Sukriti, we didn't have the hygiene, we didn't have any of the qualifications that were necessary. And you have to remember that in those days, there were hardly any Indians in our movement. In fact, there weren't any, hardly. There was a couple when, when Prabhupada was preaching in India, a few came. Of course, he met Srup Damodar Goswami in America and uh, Yasumati Nandana also in America, both of them. But very few Indians were part of our movement at that time. So he was working with all the Westerners who had no real understanding of what deity worship was how sacred it was and how important it was in establishing Krishna consciousness. And so Prabhupada's movement was to really establish that in a very, very big way. And you can see, as you go, you'll see deities of Radha and Krishna, Gornitai, different forms of Radha and Krishna in different countries around the world. Uh, there's a beautiful book called Darshan, you can go through the book, you'll find the deities and, that are being worshipped in different places all around the world. So this was Prabhupada's vision. Holy books, holy names, and now temples. The movement was expanding like wildfire, and it was all due to 
Harinam Sankirtan and book distribution, our movement was moving fast. In fact, one politician in America, he commented that if this Hare Krishna movement continues to expand the way it is, it will take over the government in 10 years. He said that. And uh, that's the way how fast our movement was. People were joining like crazy. Thousands of devotees were coming every year to join, take initiation and uh, become, you know, Vaishnavas. And so this temple worship was a very big part of Srila Prabhupada's establishment. And he knew, he knew that there were throughout the American society in different places, there were Indian communities who had migrated from India to reestablish their, their home in the West. He said, make your deity worship so gorgeous because this will attract the entire the Indian population to our movement. And so Prabhupada may, did that in such a wonderful way. And he made a lot of sacrifices because a lot of us didn't know what it meant to worship the deities. Uh, and we made a lot of mistakes. We committed a lot of offenses. But because Prabhupada had given, he would pray to Krishna, Krishna, they don't know what they're doing. Somehow be merciful to them. They're trying to serve you. Please accept their service. This was Srila Prabhupada's uh, determination to push temple movement. And there are many, many wonderful stories. How temples got opened, how we opened our temple in Vrindavan and in Bombay. The story of the, uh, the Bombay opening of the temple is a, is a major historical fact in our development. And uh, there is a book, it's still being, uh, it's either completed or it's being edited or something. There'll be a book coming out soon on the whole history of the Bombay temple. And that was an amazing story. It's a hair raising story when you read how, what Prabhupada went through to open that Radha Rasa Bihari temple, which is a grand temple now in India where th thousands of people visit our temple every day, at least before this uh, present situation with uh, coronavirus. Before then, you know, and we were distributing thousands and thousands of meals to people who would come to the temple for prashadam. It was a big, big program to feed people prashadam from all around the area. That's a wonderful story. Every, every one of the temples that Prabhupada opened wasn't easy, either because of finances or because of devotees not knowing how to deal with people in buying and organizing this, these, these temple sales. A lot of times we had to hide ourselves behind another organization as the me as the persons who were purchasing it because there are few there were people who would never sell their buildings or their churches to us there was one priest who said i would rather burn down the temple than to give it to the hari krishnas he said that but Prabhupada got that temple <laughs> he did it um so when we talk about Prabhupada. We can't just talk about a person who is a very highly spiritual personality. That's who he is. But he was a general in expanding this movement. And he was leading all of us in these different programs of expansion. Uh, and this is amazing what Srila Prabhupada did. As we study the life of Srila Prabhupada and how he brought Krishna consciousness to the world through this systematic program of step-by-step -step it's, it's a phenomena in history that has never been happened, has never happened before in such a short time with such inadequate people to do it and so little resources to start with. 
Okay, and the third part of Srila Prabhupada's four part mission in this, this was something that um, Gandhi was very big on. Gandhi was compassionate to the people who were called the Bungis and Chamaras. The Bungis and Chamaras are considered to be outcasts within the uh, Hindu society. They are not allowed in many places and they're considered to be untouchables by the higher castes. But Gandhi wanted to raise these people up to the status where they could be accepted both as worshipers and as normal people within society. So this was Gandhi's movement. And he wanted to organize that in the big way. And he tried to do that. And he called it the Hari John movement. Hari means, of course, the Supreme Lord, and John means the, those who, the followers of Hari, Hari John, the Hari John movement. And uh, I'll read something. It says here, Mahatma Gandhi started the Hari John movement in order to raise the status of the fallen people, either by social injustice or otherwise. Such movement may not be restricted only among the Bungis and Chamaras who are proclaimed as such by social injustice. But such movement may be extended, this is now, this is what Prabhupada's vision, amongst even those who are passing in society as Brahmanas and Kshatriyas. But in practice, their mentality is even more degraded or lower than the Bungis and the Chamaras. So Prabhupada's third point was uh, the initiation process. And this is what he used in order to raise people to the next status. And this was phase three, initiations in Western countries, along with light membership programs to bring people in gradually from the congregational area. And now what we have is, uh, based on this program, we have congregational ministries. We have non hot programs in, different, in all around the world. And in 1995, we started the Bhakti Riksha programs, which is another form of bringing people in, educating them, and bringing them up to the status where they can be, be qualified to receive uh, Diksha initiation. Now, Srila Prabhupada was very, very much criticized, not only by some of the saints and sadhus in India, but even by some of his god brothers for making Westerners devotees through the initiation process. As Westerners are considered to be outcasts, they're malachas. Malacha means one who eats meat or meat eaters. And then you have the Yavanas, those who don't follow any rules and regulations. So we were known, us Westerners, as Malachas and Yavanas by Brahmanas and others who were fixed in, uh, the, in culture and in spiritual understanding. But Prabhupada understood and he based his principle on one verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Mami Partha Vivyasritya Yepi Supapayonaya Striyo Vaishas Tata Sudras Tepi Anti Parangatim, Krishna says, O son of Prita, those who take shelter of me, though they be of lower birth, women, Vaishas, Sudras can attain the supreme destination. Hmm. Mam Chayo Vyavicharena Bhakti Yogena Sevati Sagunan Samatityaitan Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate, one who engages in full devotional service, at once transcends the modes of material nature and comes to the level of Brahman. But based on these verses, especially the first one we read, Prabhupada said that. We can bring people in and educate them to become Brahmanas. He said, Brahmana is not by birth, it is by qualification. 
Of course, the Westerners didn't have any qualifications. What was our qualification? We had no qualifications. We had all kinds of bad habits coming back, coming from Western upbringings with no understanding of culture, religiousness, real religiousness. We had some, some traditions of worship according to our own traditions. But there was mostly all just churchianity, just going to the temple as a function, no real religious devotion. So Prabhupada wanted to educate each and every one of the devotees to come up to the standard where they could qualify themselves for initiation. But Prabhupada saw that so many of the persons who came they would never be qualified for initiation. So he was thinking what to do. And therefore he started to teach the principles of Brahminical culture and Brahminical education as a feature to raise people up to that standard. And his, one of his main ideas was to set up a Brahminical college to educate people in, this, in the culture of becoming a Brahmana. And then in 1974, Prabhupada devised the program of education and he divided it into four parts. And that was Bhakti Shastra, Bhakti Vaibhava, Bhakti Vedanta, and Bhakti Sarvabhoma. Four levels of spiritual education comprising different parts of our scriptures. Bhakti Shastra included knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, Nectar of Devotion, Nectar of Instructions, Sri Yishupanishas. Bhakti Vaibhava included all of that plus the first six cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. And Bhakti, of course, the cantos were still coming out. <laughs> And uh, Bhakti Vedanta was from seventh canto all the way up to the end. And then Bhakti Sarvabhoma was all of that was Chaitanya Charitamrita. And so in 1974, he had Tamal Krishna Goswami draft a letter to the entire society, making this a requirement for people to receive initiation that they have to have knowledge at least within the Bhakti Shastra category. And then he wanted to institute a system of education on a systematic basis to uh, teach these different scriptures. And therefore he wanted to use the temples as places of education where classes would go on throughout the day. Of course, that never happened because the movement was engaged in so many things, they never really instituted that until only recently, when in 1995, I think it was, when, uh, or maybe a little earlier, no, it was in 19, 1990, I think, maybe 89, 90, where the Vrindavan Institute of Education started to develop and take some of the more learned teachers within our society, the learned brahmanas, and use them as teachers to, to teach these different courses. And then they've expanded into Mayapur and then other places. So now, mostly in Mayapur and in Vrindavan, we have what is called the education of Mayapur Institute, the Vrindavan Institute, to teach. Uh, we're teaching up to the level of Bhakti Vedanta, well, we haven't reached the level of Bhakti Sarvabhoma yet, but that is uh, coming up, hopefully, very soon. And Prabhupada wanted each and every devotee, and this is important, to learn this philosophy and be able to be able to speak it at any time in any given situation. Uh, it was something that was really uh, difficult to institute because um, there was so much other services going on at the time. Uh, 
keeping the temples going, going out on Harinam, distributing books, developing life membership programs and others. Um, there was a lot of activity. Prabhupada pushed the devotees one program after another. There was no time for any individual. You didn't have it. There was no, the word free time left the in, in, Iskan society. There was no, the word free time never was there. Nobody ever had any free time. And those who were serious were constantly engaged in Krishna consciousness activity. And so Srila Prabhupada pushed that, uh, third, the initiation. And then later on, he wanted to establish, and he did in a couple areas, this, uh, which didn't last long, because we found it very difficult to maintain it for whatever reason. These Vanash, well, not Vanash, but we've been in political education programs. Um, so that was Prabhupada's idea to not to create the qualifications within the individuals who are joining this society where they can be designated as Brahmins. So Prabhupada was initiating people, and then one year later, he was given Brahminical initiation. That was usually the time period. If you were initiated for one year on your first initiation, you were qualified to take second initiation. But this was something that was going on without Prabhupada's awareness that people were getting second initiation who weren't qualified. Although Prabhupada had established the, the system for developing the qualifications, it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening, but then when Prabhupada learned about that, he started to push this, this educational system stronger and stronger. Now, in order to get second initiation in our present society, one has to have Bhakti Shastra um, accreditation because um, our society is an educational movement. It's a spiritual cultural movement. Prabhupada always rejected that we are, we are not a religious movement. We're for the re-spiritualization of the entire of the world through education based on Vedic knowledge, which teaches that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and that all living entities are his parts and parcels who are meant to serve him in devotion to him. So uh, that became the feature or the focus of qualifications in order to actually come up to the standard of initiation. But it didn't happen until after Srila Prabhupada departed that education really started to take off in our society. Prabhupada was still building the infrastructure around temples, Arinam, and Prabhupada was writing and translating books as fast as he could. You can see that he, he didn't even, wasn't able to be here long enough to finish the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. He had finished the first 13 chapters of the, of the uh, first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, um, the first 13 chapters of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And then Prabhupada was no longer able to continue. And then later, not long after that, he departed the planet. And then the work was, the remaining work was taken up by a group of scholars and Brahmins in our movement who were the most qualified, Gopi Pranandana, uh, uh, Ridainanda Maharaj, and a few others who did the work of translation and creating the Bhakti Vedanta purports for the remainder of the 10th and the 11th and the 12th cantos like that. So um, this uh, Harijan movement, which was established by uh, um, Gandhi, Prabhupada saw it as a way to bring people in and to elevate them to the status of acceptability, in other words, Brahminical status. Okay. So this was 
Prabhupada's uh, third phase, initiation and the development of congregation. Right now, we, we say, see within our movement, we are not a temple-based movement. For the first, I don't know how many years, maybe until maybe a year or two after Srila Prabhupada departed, we remained a temple-based movement. We hardly had any congregation. No money was coming in from outside, very rarely, if any. And all the money that was needed to, uh, to propagate the movement was done through book distribution and various other simple ways of raising money. Some of them weren't, didn't last because they weren't approved types of means, but we thought of different ways of raising money. But book distribution was the main reason or the main way. And because of book distribution, uh, the temples continued to maintain and flourish for many, many years. Now, this was three of the four principles of Srila Prabhupada's mission. The fourth one was Vanashram, which is the unfulfilled part of his mission, which is just starting to uh, develop now within our society. And uh, I'll address that section of Prabhupada's four, uh, fourth part in my second uh, presentation in this particular presentation we're making here. So I suggest the devotees take some time. You can go online, find Srila Prabhupada's conception of Gita Nagari, written in 19. 48 and published in the Back to Godhead magazine in 1950, May of 1956. Uh, it was pu published in two parts. The first part was only about six or seven pages. The rest was another 24 pages after that. And Prabhupada really gets into the anomalies of the present society. And it's interesting, Prabhupada was really, really uh, focus that the whole world is demoniac. It is filled with demoniac qualities and people are being dragged down by all these demoniac qualities. And so he talks very strongly within this Gita Nagari concept to uproot all this and reestablish real spirituality amongst the people eliminate all this pretentious spirituality that goes in the name of various spiritual movements around the world. And to glorify and to illustrate the, high, the highest position of spiritual knowledge, Srimad Bhagavatam. Because as is explained in Bhagavatam itself, that Bhagavatam is the incarnation of Krishna when Krishna left the planet, he left himself in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada, in his introduction to Srimad Bhagavatam, he writes that uh, this book, when it's applied, is enough for the entire re-spiritualization of the entire world, Srimad Bhagavatam. It has principles of sociology, uh, political principles, altruistic principles. In Prabhupada's purport, he covered even biological principles, so many categories that people study in different colleges and universities around the world became topics that Prabhupada presented through the Srimad Bhagavatam and his Bhaktivedanta purports. So if one reads and studies Srimad Bhagavatam very thoroughly and carefully, you'll find everything is in Bhagavatam for, the, for, for everything you want to know on any subject. It's all there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. It requires some careful study in order to see it because a lot of it is encased within other principles that are being presented simultaneously. Okay, so 
I'll conclude there with uh, about 20 minutes left in our session. So uh, perhaps we can open it up for comments or questions. Yes, Hare Krishna. I'll be taking the questions from devotees and address them to you. Thank you for a lovely class. I think it's the first time many of us have heard about this Gita Nagri scheme. So thank you for introducing us to this scheme and further reading. Thank you. So we have, if we can take question, we have a first question that's come in for you, Maharaj. And the question is, it's anonymous. <laughs> And the question is, um, as many of Shura Prabhupada's disciples are starting to leave, what is your main message to the next generation? What do you see is your biggest hope and your biggest concern for the future of ISKCON? Well, I think that'll be addressed in my next presentation. This is Prabhupada's fourth part of his mission, the establishment of the Van Ashram system within the society. And that's one of the reasons why, because it's not there, it's one of the reasons why people cannot stay steady in Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada made a statement in 1974. Before then, Prabhupada had completely disruled the idea of uh, presenting the Van Ashram system. But then when he saw that devotees who were in the movement, practicing Krishna consciousness, chanting Hare Krishna, could not stay steady in their practice of Krishna consciousness, he saw that this was now there was a need for Van Ashram. And he mentions that in different sections throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam where it's not, there are four kinds of Van Ashrams, the material Van Ashrams, there are, um, the traditional Van Ashram system, but then Prabhupada wanted to establish Daivi Van Ashram. Daivi Van Ashram means spiritual Van Ashram. People will be engaged according to their nature. They'll serve the Lord will serve the mission according to their nature. And that nature has to be brought out through education and development. And once it's understood, then persons can be engaged according to their nature and provide tremendous contributions and stay enthusiastic in their devotion and service. When Prabhupada started the mission in the early days, he just, he knew he didn't have much time. He had his third heart attack in about a few years in 1967. So Prabhupada said, I had prayed to Krishna at that time to please give me more time, my mission. And Prabhupada said, Krishna gave me 10 more years. And he said that in, towards the end of his last year. That... Uh, Prabhupada was just anyone who was willing to do any service in any way was put into that service. And a lot of times things didn't work out so well. But Prabhupada was adjusting things to make things work and trying at the same time to keep his devotees strong in their practice of Krishna consciousness. And devotees did leave. And Prabhupada made that point that now, and this is 1974, he turned around his whole conception and said, now we have to establish this Van Ashram. Otherwise, our movement will not grow. And so that was the turning point. And then from 1974, all the way up to 77, Prabhupada spoke on establishing the whole Van Ashram. Of course, it was dropped from the priority list after Prabhupada left. People couldn't see how to do it. It was a little attempt. It was completely lost. We went back to what we were doing. 
And again, uh, devotees could not stay steady in their practice of Krishna consciousness because they were not engaged according to their nature. Now, anyone can serve the Lord in any way when you are on the on a more high platform. In other words, when you're on the liberated platform of practicing devotional service, you can do any service for the Lord. But that doesn't apply to everyone. So when a person is engaged according to their nature, their contribution to that service and to the society becomes ideal. And it also inspires the individual to offer more and they grow in their own service and they grow in that in their own particular nature. That nature is called swadharma. That means your material nature. And that requires an educational process. So we'll speak about that, but that's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why devotees could not stay in our movement. We found it too difficult to keep up with Krishna consciousness. There was other reasons, but that was one of the reasons. We were putting people out on Sankirtan who should never have been out on the streets distributing books. They should have been doing other things. And because of that, their material desires, which they had somewhat was fighting against, reawakened because they were in, they were not engaged in the way they should have been. And this was happening in many places around the world. Fortunately, Prabhupada had created a, a cadre, a group of really fixed inner circle devotees who were working very closely with Prabhupada to spread the movement. These were devotees that were really dedicated to Prabhupada and were willing to do anything to spread Krishna consciousness and complete allegiance to Prabhupada. And because of them, the rest of the movement also was inspired to continue. So they became Prabhupada's immediate assistance in bringing Krishna consciousness. But still, we found there were so many difficulties in keeping devotees lack of education and lack of proper engagement. A person can do any engagement when they're surrendered, but in the long term, if they're not engaged according to their nature, they will find it hard to stay steady in that practice. So that was Prabhupada's fourth part of the mission, which we'll speak about that in detail. Uh, tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Our second question, Maharaj, is from Dimple Mataji. She's saying, Hare Krishna, dear Maharaj, lovely to hear from you. You mentioned how temples previously didn't have much of an Indian congregation. Now the movement has been taken up by Indian communities in certain areas. As we try to again connect with a more ethically, ethnically diverse audience, can you suggest, can you kindly share on how we can do this um, in a relatable, relevant way to people who are new to Krishna consciousness? Yeah, educational programs. <laughs> Prabhupada wanted to educate the congregation into our philosophy and into our practice because he knew that the Indian culture was quite diverse in their understanding of how spirituality goes on. And Prabhupada was a little afraid and at the same cautious that these, these other concepts don't filter into our society and take away from the eternal principles that he established. So, um, and that happened in so many places. Uh, and it happened for different reasons, but Prabhupada said, we have to educate the congregation. We have to have classes, we have to have programs in the, both in the community and in the, uh, in the temples for systematic education on Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and all of the main books that Prabhupada uh, presented. 
So that's the way when, when you have a person who's educated and not only in the philosophy, but in the understanding of the philosophy as Srila Prabhupada gave it to us for the application of this knowledge. Because otherwise we get into a lot, we get into some sub-religious principles coming filtering in and going on as mainstream. For instance, when I was in Chicago, and there's a there's a festival every year called Maha Shivaratri. We just passed it, it was in March. And so many of the Indian congregations they want to share uh, worship Lord Shiva on that day, and because they came to our temples, they also wanted to do that in the temples. And so in some places it, it came in like that, but that wasn't Prabhupada's mood. He said, you know, we worship Krishna and his expansions in our temples. We don't worship the demigods in the temples. And so we had a lot of problems with that. So what we did is we celebrated Maha Shivaratri simply by glorification of Lord Shiva and not in a formal worship. And we had, when I was in Chicago, we had a lot of uh, contentions with me in the Indian community about uh, having Shiva worship in the temple. And there was a lot of discussion, even arguments about this should be done. But Prabhupada said, you know, we should be very strict and follow according to how he gave it. And so we wouldn't allow more and more <laughs> principles coming in from different areas of spirituality that would been practiced in India. Some of it impersonalism, some of it Mayavadism, some of it uh, demigod worship. Like that. So we have to um, educate people that this is how we worship. And this is the standard we keep. If you want to worship out uh, these other, then you can do that in your own homes, but not in the temples. Hope, you... Is that clear? Simple Mataji, I hope that answers your question. Please let us know in the chat whether you need clarification. Next question is by our Jankinath Prabhu. <laughs> Jankinath Prabhu is asking, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the wonderful class. Once I heard in a class that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur left the world 10 years earlier so that he can give that extra 10 years to Sri Prabhupada. Is this true? I've never seen that reference for this, but this class, Jankinath. Well, all we know in terms of uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's departure is what Prabhupada has told us. And Prabhupada never said that. <laughs> he did say that his spiritual master left because there were too many neophytes. And this is also a feature of why the spiritual master may leave earlier is when his disciples remain neophyte. Despite every effort to bring them up, they don't change or they don't come up to at least the second class platform, which is called the Madhyama platform, which is the platform by which our movement operates on. The four principles of Madhyama is that uh, we worship the Supreme Personality of God and Sri Krishna as our worshipful Lord. We make friends and serve and work together with other devotees. We uh, preach the message of Lord Chaitanya to the general population, and we avoid the uh, atheist non-devotees who are against the principles of Krishna or spirituality. So that's the platform, and that's mentioned in Bhagavatam by which our, our movement operates on. The lower platform, Kanista Adhikari, is that Persons don't preach, 
They simply worship the deity and the spiritual master, and they don't develop uh, friendly and uh, what we say intimate relationship, not intimate, but in some cases intimate, but in general, they don't develop relationships with other Vaishnavas. That's the Kanista Adhikari. So when there's too many of that within a society of disciples, then sometimes the spiritual master leave. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said that himself, there are too many neophytes. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was an, a missionary that was sent by Lord Chaitanya to come and do this work. He came from the personal entourage of Lord Krishna to come and do this work. And he left uh, after he felt he couldn't do any more to expand the movement. Because what he started and what was developed at one point started to go down and down and down. And as hard as he tried, he couldn't bring it back up. It's... But that statement that is, was given to us, that Prabhupada, he left 10 men, no, because there's a big gap between Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's departure, which was in 1937, January 1st, 1937, he left. Prabhupada's mission didn't start until 1965. Now, there's at least 28 years there. So I don't think that statement has much value. In fact, I don't believe it at all, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Um, Vimple Mataji said, thank you, Maharaj. That was helpful for the last question. We'll take one more question, Maharaj, because we have to go into our next Kirtan. And any questions that we've left unanswered, we can then um, approach them tomorrow, if that's okay, Maharaj. So our next question is, which I think a lot of people have this in mind, is given the demoniac nature of the world, should we pray to get out of this world or is that selfish? And we sh or should we pray to stay here and serve? Uh, B. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lord Chaitanya's movement is meant to flourish. And we want everyone to be here as long as they can to contribute to bringing Lord Chaitanya's movement in. It's, to want to go back home is good, but to want to stay and preach Krishna consciousness is, is what we're asked to do. And leave it up to Krishna. When Krishna wants to take you, he'll take you at the time that it's, that it's right for you. Uh, we develop, it's almost like an ambivalent mood is that I don't want to be here, but I, I'm here because I have a mission to help my spiritual master bring Krishna consciousness and whatever I can do to assist, and that will be my, you know, service that will be to my credit. Um, that's a, that's a natural feeling, but in practicality, it shouldn't be something that we actually desire. We should desire to serve, especially to preach. <laughs> I hope, I hope that answers the question. Um, whoever sent it in, please let us know if you need clarification. So, Maharaj, if we can stop there and go on to the next part of our program, is that okay?
Um, I believe you're in control. <laughs> okay, so we can go on to the next part of our program. And um, we've got lovely, beautiful kirtans that Mother Shama, uh, Shoma Dhatri and the Slovenian devotees have put together. So if we can unmute Mother Shama Dhatri and the Slovenian devotees, see if they're ready. Pacha Tatva, Hare Krishna. Thank you. 
Krishna Panchatattva, thank you for a lovely kirtan. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Panchatattva. So that brings us to the end of today's session. First of all, thank you, Panchatattva. Thank you for the exactly kirtan. Again, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for a lovely session. And we look forward to hearing part from you. We look forward to welcoming also Buddha Bhavana Prabhu tomorrow. I know he's online, so Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, we look forward to hearing from you tomorrow as well for part two in the afternoon. That just leaves us to thank everybody for joining today. And we will see everybody tomorrow, UK time. Um, if you can join 10 minutes early, so 11.50, PM, AM, sorry, UK time. That would be appreciated. On behalf of the retreat team, we would like to say, Pancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Ebacha Kita Nam Kavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha. We will see everybody tomorrow, bright and early. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. And wish Guru Maharaj their um, blessings and their Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.